Hey, welcome to the Lincoln Network Podcast, where you can find a wide variety of conversations on technology, democracy, and national security. You can watch these conversations on YouTube, and you can also find them wherever you listen to your podcasts. In 2021, the United States faced growing cyber threats. Already this year, the nation has experienced significant disruptions to critical infrastructure, including the ransomware attacks against the Colonial Pipeline and the agricultural sector. Uh, this follows the solar winds breach of the fall of last year and a decade of alarming cyber attacks. With this context, what should national policymakers do to confront growing cyber risks? Today, I'm honored to be hosting two of the nation's experts from the telecom industry to help us answer that question. Chris Boyer is Vice President for Global Security and Technology Policy at AT&T, where he's responsible for the company's global policy positions related to cybersecurity, national security, and technology policy. Chris works closely with AT&T's uh, Chief Security Office and AT&T's Technology and Operations to address policy issues at the intersection of emerging technology, cybersecurity, and national security. Robert Mayer is Senior Vice President of Cyber Security and Innovation with the U.S. Telecom Association, with responsibility for leading cyber and national security policy and strategic initiatives. He's the current chairman of the Communications Sector Coordinating Council, and he's also serves as the co-chair of the DHS ICT Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force. Chris and Robert, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Can you please begin by providing a little background about your perspective about these current cyber risks and, and the policy debates around them? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, clearly um, something's not working right, right? Because we're, we're continuing to see more and more of these types of attacks. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious to anyone who's watching right now that um, we need to do more, not, not just from a private sector perspective, but really as a country and in, in, in trying to deal with some of these challenges that are out there today. Um, that's not to say that um, my own industry and, and my company through at t is not doing a lot in this space because we most certainly are and we take it very seriously. Um, but obviously we need, to, we need to update our strategy. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to start over. You know, there's a lot of uh, policy work that's already been done over the years. Uh, I think Robert and I have been at this for over a decade now. Um, you know, you can go all the way back to the Lieberman Collins legislation that was you know, proposed back in 2010 or 11 or the uh, President Obama's executive order 13636 talking about um, the NIST framework for critical infrastructure. You know, so there's, there's been a whole series of things that have happened along the way. And I think um, we've made incremental progress, but obviously, um, you know, we're at a critical juncture here where the attacks are increasing. You know, other, it, it appears anyway that others are now targeting, you know, um, critical infrastructure more and more. So, um, so I just think the, the threat has ratcheted up, you know, substantially and that um, we're going to have to continue to evolve you know, our policy to keep up with that. And that doesn't, like I said, it doesn't mean starting over. I think we can build upon a lot of what's already there. You know, I think CISA as an agency, which was just started, I think a couple of years ago uh, by Congress, you know, it's a good place to start the public private partnership that they have. You know, we have really strong uh, linkages with CISA and work very closely with them on communications infrastructure. So I think we can build upon those processes, but there's certainly, I think um, a need to, you know, in, on both sides of the equation, there's a need to um, continue to evolve our strategy so that we, build up our defense so that um, we can prevent some of these attacks from happening or at least minimize the, the damage. And on the flip side, I think we also need to seriously consider what our strategy is going to be on the other side of the issue and, you know, addressing some of these, these bad actors. Um, that's a, easier said than done. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of talk here recently by both the administration and Congress in doing that. But, um, you know, those are areas that I think we, we both need to start working, continue to work in. Yeah. Um, uh Thank you for the opportunity to be on this podcast. Um, I, I agree with uh, Chris. I think we, as a sector in particular, uh, have accomplished a lot in, in the last decade with respect to cybersecurity. I think we've indicated that we are very committed to the public-private partnership, um, going back to the intense efforts that we were involved with when the um, uh, NIST cybersecurity framework was established. Uh, immediately after that, our sector worked to uh, um, apply and adapt uh, the framework to uh, five communication segments, broadcast cable, satellite wireless, and wireline. Um, I think uh, the word incremental is interesting because, and we'll talk about, I'm sure, the executive order uh, that has recently come out where the White House said, look, incrementalism is not enough right now. Um, and I think we're at a point where, frankly, the uh, the 
intensity of the attacks and uh, the impacts the, the uh, attacks are having has become more obvious to people. Um, and I think just look back in, you know, in the last six months, the solar winds, I think, has had a profound impact on the thinking of people who have responsibility for government systems. Uh, the fact that it was so extensive and it was undetected for so many months uh, and had so much of an impact across so many agencies, I think, was, was, a, was alarming to many and, and needed to be addressed. Uh, you know, followed by Microsoft Exchange issues, and then most recently, uh, the Colonial Pipeline. Uh, what I think is happening in part here is that to some extent, you know, the attacks, uh, when you're talking about data theft, uh, even the OPM attack, you know, it's, it's a problem, but most people kind of have a distance from the problem, don't experience it directly, uh, don't suffer the immediate harms from that. Uh, but when you start talking about things like the colonial uh, pipeline, I think for the probably for the first time when you talk about the entire East Coast, you know, seeing prices rise uh, dramatically over the course of a week, um, the availability of gasoline, uh, you know, it starts affecting people's lives in a very direct and personal way. Uh, and that, of course, is a great motivator for people in government to to respond. So, um, you know, we have we should anticipate that there'll be a greater sense of urgency uh, as a result of the, the, the frequent attacks that are underway. Chris brought up earlier that um, the ongoing effort that's happened over the last decade, starting with Lieberman Collins and the um, executive order establishing the NIST framework. Um, it, it strikes, I was on the Hill at the time of Lieberman Collins, and it strikes me that um, since that time, there's been a lot of bipartisan consensus around a lot of the pilot policy issues uh, of, uh, in cybersecurity. You know, one of the, the areas of growing interest over the past um, several years has been addressing supply chain risk management. Um, there's, there, there's been legislation in uh, past uh, a couple years ago on the Hill that uh, was trying to help the federal government improve uh, its supply chain risk management. Now there's a, a, a focus on trying to um, help the critical infrastructure sectors address supply chain risk management. Back in February, President uh, Biden um, issued an executive order. It was an early um, move in his um, approach to cybersecurity policy. It requiring a national review of, of uh, supply chain risk management. Uh, can you guys share some thoughts about um, that executive order and what we've learned so far from its implementation and the ongoing reviews? Chris, you want me to start? Yeah, it's probably best since you are intimately. Yeah, Sure, I'll, I'll just, I'll take a shot at it. So uh, in terms of what we're about to learn, uh, interesting that um, uh, the February 24th supply chain order called for two items. One was a, a hundred day review um, focused part, largely on the semiconductors and chips, not exclusively. And then there was a one year, a one year effort that's underway. The hundred day review, I believe is going to be released um, I know there are some conversations that are happening later today. Uh, over the course of the next few days, I think we'll see uh, the results of that effort where uh, the White House, along with the Commerce Department and others, uh, did an intense inquiry into this, the issue around semiconductors and chips. And that's been in the news lately quite a bit. Um, on the, on the one-year effort, we are directly involved through the task force uh, uh, in conversations with uh, DHS, uh, who's working, who are working with uh, the BIS Commerce and the White House on the one-year effort, um, and this is part of an effort that involves both the IT sector and the comm sector, since they're interested in the ICT ecosystem and the goods and materials potentially that have supply chain vulnerabilities. So, uh, again, what you're seeing, I think, is an effort by this administration in the White House to um, really up the ante, so to speak, on addressing the, the vulnerabilities in the supply chain. Um, we saw a lot of this, for example, as a result of COVID-19, it illuminated problems in the supply chain. Uh, and there was some analysis that we did uh, around the supply chain where we identified things like challenges with just-in-time inventory management, uh, transparency, the ability to have visibility into the upstream uh, suppliers who were supporting uh, your, uh, who, who were supporting the products that our, our sector buys from vendors. Um, and then also the, the, the concentration in terms of sole region, sole company suppliers. 
uh, most of the technology is coming from four uh, sources within within Asia. So there's a real concentration there. Um, the question really becomes, it, it's so complex, the supply chain ad, efforts, and we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing in our, in our work, but I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we identified nine, carry, ca nine areas of supply chain uh, vulnerabilities, risks, everything from legal to counterfeit to inherited risk that you can take to cybersecurity. And within those nine areas, there were like well over 200 specific uh, threats to the supply chain. Um, it's mind boggling to think about how, how many permutations of risks from supply chain can occur and how do you protect yourself? How do you mitigate the risk? Which of course falls to companies like Chris and AT&T, um, you know, who have thousands of suppliers and he can speak to that. And how do you manage that? I think becomes an increasingly monumental task. I think, yeah, I mean, kind of pick it up on that theme. I mean, I feel like as a, as a business, you know, the thing I, I've had many conversations with our supply chain team in recent months about what are the things that are going on? And, you know, what, how could government policy potentially help you manage the risk that we have. And the one thing that I, I think comes up a lot is really this idea of transparency from the vendors about, you know, under, getting, giving us a better understanding of what our supply chain risk is. So you look at things like what's going on at, in, at NTIA where they were, they were working on a software bill of materials or, um, you know, um, our vendors that we would onboard onto the network and having them help us understand where they may have uh, particular sensitivities, like, you know, points of failure or what have you in their supply chain. You know, I think those are all areas that are that are really important, and I, I don't think it needs, but but I don't think we need like um, at least for a company of our size. I'm not sure that we need to have you know a, a, all that information ingested in government and have massive reports being sent out and, and that kind of thing. I, I think what we really need is you know kind of a general understanding with an industry that these that these are appropriate practices that that type of information should be shared with you know with both from suppliers to customers so that we can understand and do a better assessment of our risk. And we're, we're actually pretty good. And managing our supply chain, I, I, we just did an event like two weeks ago, uh, where my chief uh, head of supply, head of global supply chain, spoke about semiconductors because you know semiconductors is a really critical issue, and I know there's been a lot of discussion here recently about the impact on certain sectors of the economy, but it's a big deal for um, for companies like mine because if you look at the services that we provide, whether it's mobility or you know our, our broadband services, they're all dependent upon devices that ultimately use semiconductors, and the equipment that we deploy in the network is dependent upon semiconductors. So. Big, it's a really important issue to us. And when she spoke about this issue, she talked about how you know we've had stressors on our supply chain in the past. The pandemic's not the first one, and you know we're usually we're generally fairly good at planning ahead of time and trying to deal with these these stressors. But the key is we have to have the information available to us to make you know to, to help us manage those risks, right? So it all comes back to some level of transparency and, and ability to plan in advance for the stressors that we might see in the future. Now you're always going to have unforeseen consequences like the pandemic. Um, you know, that, that happened. But I think the more you can have that type of information, the better prepared you can be, and you'll know where your touch points are so that you can react accordingly. And I think the government can help push us more in that, in that general direction without making it something that's really overbearing or bureaucratic or difficult to do, then I think that actually would be a step in the right direction. Yeah, Dan, if I could just add something to, to that uh, for a sure. moment. So um, to Chris's point and related to the executive order that you mentioned uh, from February, uh, one of the things that the comm sector has has already take, undertaken is um, we've looked at our infrastructure, our uh, critical functions that you know DHS has worked on now for a couple of years, and specifically what they call the connect function. Um, and uh, what we've discovered is that there are a variety of finished products, so to speak, that go into our networks. Everything from uh, you know in in the broadcasting world, the emergency alert systems in the in, in our world, the switches that we buy, the routers that we buy, uh, the circuit boards that, that are purchased, the fiber optics that are purchased, and you can just think of all of these products. And you know, we may have four or five suppliers uh, of these of, of all of these products, um, and think that oh, we have we have diversity in the in the supply uh, supply chain. What we what we don't necessarily have is insight into the components. That, that go into those products. So the IT companies, the vendors that make these companies and all of their upstream suppliers, well, they may all use the same company in one geographic region or even in one country. Um, and therefore they have a vulnerability with that. There could be political vulnerabilities with certain rare earth elements or other um, basic uh, materials. 
Um, and I think what we're hoping to see is that this inquiry into the supply chain is going to give us greater visibility so that we have a better handle on what the risk is uh, as we bring in these products into our, into our networks. Earlier, you mentioned the DHS Supply Chain uh, Risk Management Task Force um, that you are co-chair of. Um, I saw that it, last month uh, you all put out guidance to, um, to the sector. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about your work that's been ongoing um, there and how um, government and industry are working together to try and you know, get these best practices out there? Yeah, so I think, let me, let me take that. And then I, yeah, I think Chris can add his perspective um, as he's part of the leadership of those efforts as well. So uh, the task force was created in 2018, um, all the way back going to Secretary Nielsen and uh, the first cybersecurity summit as, and the, the development of the National Risk Management Center. Uh, the DHS ICT Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force, and that's a, a lot of words, uh, was, was, was a creature of, of, of that uh, initial thinking within the NRMC. Um, since then, we've had we've had a one year one year of projects. We had a second year of projects. Uh, then, in December of 2019, we started a shorter term half year project. Um, the thinking there was that we knew that there was going to be an election. There would be a change. In, there could be a change in administration. There was clearly going to be a change at the DHS secretariat level, um, and we wanted to get a better sense of the new any new policies that were coming from the, from the from the from leadership at DHS or the White House. So we are right now at the point in time where we are, uh, you know, waiting for the arrival of the new uh, director of the CISLA agency um, and try to get a sense working with government about what the priorities are in the supply chain. Having said that, I will tell you that um, we've had over the course of the two and a half years of projects, we have 20 voting members from the IT sector, 20 voting members from the communication sector, and we have 20 voting members representing approximately a dozen federal agencies, um, all coming together, identifying projects of interest, developing the projects, um, you know, developing reports, um, as many as 300 subject matter experts at any given time have been working on developing these reports. And I know you're gonna be providing Uh, to looking at the threats that were inherent in uh, in the supply chain that I mentioned, uh, to looking at what enterprises can do with respect to developing qualified bidder or qualified manufacturing lists. We also worked on a major project to identify best practices for companies that were acquiring products. What are the questions they should be asking their vendors to give them a level of assurance around, around supply chain security? Um, and I think, uh, it truly is, in my opinion, uh, uh, really an excellent example uh, of the, the manifestation and the aspirations of the public-private partnership, because we do sit in these environments and we work together and collaborate um, with our colleagues across the IT and comm sectors, with the government uh, uh, representatives, and are very focused and concentrated on one, identifying projects that are gonna be of value to industry and to the government, and to make sure that we're not just providing shelfware. And I'll finally say that one of the projects we're working on now is to look at the products we developed over two years and making sure it gets out into the stakeholder community, that they're understood and that we benefit from feedback and can involve them potentially over time. I think that's one of the most important things is that we're not just putting, you know, we're writing, not writing a paper and putting it on a shelf somewhere and, you know, nothing's actually happening differently. There's, there's a lot of that that goes on. I think, you know, the goal ought to be to do things that actually change how we're operating in a way and, 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 and improve the way we're operating. And that's kind of why I was going back to that transparency point. And, and the, other, the other side of it is, you know, how do, we, how do we take all these different things that are happening around supply chain with government and actually make it operational and actually, you know, actually impact, you know, how we're doing the security, you know, in our supply chains. And that, that's the part of it that I think has always been the challenge is how do you take these things and implement them in a way where they can be effective? You know, it's one thing that it goes back to like the 2015 information sharing law that was passed, right? We, we passed a law, we thought we addressed a lot of the, you know, information sharing challenges around security, but we continue to have information sharing challenges in security and everybody knows that. And so, it does, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the law wasn't the right law or that we need a different statute. It really means that 
it really comes down to how we implement that and, and actually effectuating that policy in a way that can be useful, you know, both for industry and government. So I still think there's things that can be done in that area. You mentioned the um, legislation from 2015. Around that time, included in that bill, were some measures aimed to improve uh, federal cybersecurity, and that clearly is also an ongoing progress uh, area where progress needs to be made. Um, we've talked a lot about the cyber, uh, supply chain executive order from February. Love to get your guys' takes on the um, recent executive order from last month, which was intended to improve the federal government's cybersecurity. And you know, broadly about the issue of where the federal government is in terms of cybersecurity capacity and expertise and uh, resources to carry out its responsibilities. Um, we talk a lot about uh, public-private partnerships, but um, the, that partnership is only as strong as the as it's uh, both partners, and that requires the federal government to to step up. Can you guys um, share any thoughts about the EO or related issues about federal cyber capacity? Chris, you want to start? Yeah, sure. I mean, as far as the EO goes, I think it was a step in the right direction. Like, I, I think there's there's obviously a lot of things that have to be sorted out as it's implemented. So there's you know quite a few open questions about implementation of it. But I think the issues that they flag, like improving federal cybersecurity, you know, improving incident reporting, you know, driving home um, security standards for federal agencies, uh, the issues around the Internet of Things, and, and looking at different programs there. Um, the, the discussion of things like um, um, strong authentication or um, identity management and all those capacities, um, you know, software assurance and the whole program that they've talked about there. I mean, those are all things that I think have been talked about for years within the industry. And clearly, given the, the series of events that we've seen over the last six to 12 months, they're definitely heading down the right path in terms of putting them out there. Um, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to work with, um, you know, with all the various agencies that are tasked with these different functions. You know, and, and my impression has been that the administration and the agencies are very much open to working with industry to make sure that they get this right. Um, so I think I think it'll be. So I think overall the EO is a good document. I think it's heading in the right direction. Like I said, there's 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 always things that have to be sorted out as it's implemented. But I do think it's heading the right way. I will say for the federal government, I don't want to make excuses for them, but I, I feel like in some respects it's a difficult issue for them. I mean, I mean, I used to serve on the the NIST uh, Internet Sec Information Security and Privacy Advisory Board for years, and we would get briefings from you know, agencies, CIOs, and others about um, the challenges that federal agencies face with, you know, um, frankly, systems that are that are old and, and outdated in some respects, and all the challenges they have with implementing and, uh, and updating. And, you know, it's not an easy task. Like, I don't want to underestimate the complexity. Just like any large enterprise, it's a complicated business, you know, and the, and the problem in security, and the reason why defense only carries you so far is because it only takes, you know, even with things like strong authentication and I did, you know, multi-factor authentication and all those different issues. It only takes, you know, one or two people to get a phishing scam to create havoc, you know, in an organization. And what you're talking about here are organizations with hundreds of thousands of people that work there. So, um, so while there's ways you can you can engineer the network to segments and you know and 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 block off you know access to certain people and apply multi-factor, those are all things really they ought to be. And I think this is what the EO says: they ought to be basically table stakes. They ought to be things that everybody does in order to secure their systems. And you can really make it more difficult, but at the end of the day, you're still gonna have cyber events. There's no realistic scenario where this thing is 100% foolproof. And I think I think that's a challenge for everyone, but I, I was encouraged that, you know, the administration seems to be heading down the right areas. And I, I know some of the folks there, you know, have a lot of experience. Uh, Jeff Green who works on the White House, served with me on the DSPAD for a number of years. He's a really smart guy. And I, th I, think, they're, I think they're definitely heading in the right direction. Yeah, um, let, me, let me tell you that, um, uh, I, in all of my years and looking at many EOs, I can't recall a situation where I've seen uh, a 16 page document so full of um, very specific uh, expressions of what the expectations are on the part of, of, of the drafters of this document for federal agencies. Um, Chris mentioned a few of the areas. I mean, in each one of these areas, um, whether it's software security, or, or IoT or uh, practices that need to be set up to, to protect networks, everything from encryption to zero trust architectures, multi-factor um, authentication, and, and the list goes on uh, for pages. Um, it is, in my view, a statement of um, great urgency explaining to the federal government that, you know, they say very specifically, uh, incrementalism, incremental improvements is not going to get us there. Um, so they need to make some really dramatic changes in the way they look at cybersecurity, the way they hold themselves accountable, 
the way they hold contractors accountable. Um, I think what's interesting about this executive order is that it is going to have implications and and direct uh, developments uh, across the ecosystem and potentially across the world uh, by virtue of the fact that the market power that the U.S. federal government has uh, and the implications of requiring contractors uh, to meet the same expectations that they're putting onto these agencies, that the relationships between the agencies and the service providers, uh, like AT&T, like cloud service providers, uh, the level of scrutiny around the protections, the cybersecurity protections, are really going to be intense. And I and I actually think that if this and the level of accountability on this doc and in this document is very significant. The review processes, uh, the timelines are very aggressive. Um, all of which suggests that one, I think, uh, um, Chris is exactly right. The people who drafted this, these are people who knew what they were talking about. Um, it's clear to me that you know the editor they, they they drafted this and it went through multiple iterations to get the language and the and the tone right and the balance right. Um, I think it's going to have a big impact, and I think it is a game changer in terms of uh, setting expectations for uh, federal agencies and setting accountability, frankly, for those agencies. That's really encouraging to hear. A last question for you both is. A lot when we think about cybersecurity, a lot of the conversation um, focuses on what's happening in Washington at the federal government at the kind of national policy level. But much of what we're seeing in terms of um, cyber threats and incidents is occurring you know, down at the um, very local and organizational level. We're seeing school districts you know, shut for um, periods of time due to ransomware attacks, hospitals affected. Um, and this, of course, uh, reaches up into the critical infrastructure sectors. You know, what advice would you give or where would you point um, organizations that are uh, really on the front lines of the ongoing cyber conflict to try and get their hands around these, these threats? Uh, Chris, can I, can I start on that? And uh, so I, that's a great question and I have an easy answer for you. Um, June 2nd, 2021, uh, the White House wrote a, a letter to corporate executives and business leaders. And it's all in that three page document about what people should do. Um, and I like the fact that it talks about uh, at the local level, as you said, you know, convene leadership teams to discuss ransomware and review corporate security posture and business continuity plans to ensure you have the ability to continue to quickly restore operations. And then it talks about the five major best practices uh, and endpoint detection and response, multi-factor authentication, um, encryption of data at rest, the patching of, 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 of software. It's all in there. Um, so my thinking on this is that you really at this point have no excuse for not addressing some of this if you're an organization. Um, you really are on notice that you have a duty to I think deploy these basic protections for your organization. Uh, it has to come from the leadership, which is why I believe they sent it to the executives. It's very unusual, I think, for the White House to send a notice like that. Usually it comes from CISA or the FBI, but this came directly from the White House. There's real urgency here. I mean, even 60 Minutes last night had a whole thing on ran ransomware. So it's getting a lot of attention. It's very debilitating. It's very costly. Um, and we're, you know, the people who are, Putting, putting this on us are sophisticated enterprises. Many times they have affiliations with nation states, although it might be tenuous, there are relationships there. So you have an obligation, I think, to do at least the, the, the basic hygienic things that we know can serve as, as, as protections. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think this is actually one of the biggest challenges that we have in security. I mean, there's two factors, I think. One is um, you, you know, as you say, is getting it outside of the conversation in Washington and out to the front lines. And, and literally what we're talking about here is like small and medium sized businesses and schools and hospitals. And, you know, the ransomware thing has just gone, gone um, spiral out of control over the last 12 months, you know, with the, starting with the pandemic, but now going even further. And so I, I think there's, there's a huge task in, our, in front of us about how do we get folks up to speed in those, in those roles to really improve security. You know the other the other side of it is is um, you know is is a lot of those entities just don't I mean frankly 
should they need to leverage tools that are available to them from other entities, you know, security companies and managed services providers and, and the like, who actually may have help them be able to help them with security so they can plan better. You know, there, there's folks that will come out there and help them organize up front, you know, how to organize their networks in such a way to minimize the damage and make sure they have backups. You know, there's a lot of um, security expertise and consultants that will help with that. So I think, but I think part of the issue is just getting the, is getting cutting through the inertia and getting folks out in the front lines to really see this is something that just has to be done and, and invest in, you know, improving their security capabilities. But it's one thing to have a discussion inside the beltway here in DC about everything that needs to be done. It's another thing actually taking that and transporting it out to people on the front lines. And I think that's a huge challenge that we have. The other side of that issue is the educational piece. You know, there's a huge issue around just the cybersecurity workforce. And then we've talked for years. Uh, I remember going to conferences around the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, the NICE initiative, which I think was launched like in, I don't know, 2012 or 13 or something. It's been around for like six or seven years. You know, it's a great initiative and they put a lot of resources into it. Um, and I, I know the people that run that and they're, they're good people as well. I just think it's a challenge of like, how do you take all of that and really translate that out the door? And I think there's, there's, um, there's certainly a need for more cybersecurity professionals, more cybersecurity expertise that we can push out and, you know, and, and, and really help folks on the front lines deal with security. I think both of those issues are things that, that need additional thought. Really appreciate that advice. Um, we're about out of time and I'm really grateful for your uh, uh, joining us and um, sharing this uh, expertise and advice and thoughts with us. Um, to close us out, would you guys provide any um, closing remarks for our audience? Any message you want to get across? Well, I'll take a shot. Look, um, the problem's not going to get go away. It's going to intensify. We're never going to be able to eliminate 100% of the threat. We have to stay as close as we can to our adversaries and hopefully one step ahead of them. And that's going to require all of government, all of society effort. Um, but I am encouraged. I think the administration has set in motion um, some activities that should bear bear results. And importantly, uh, they recognize it's clear that they can't do this. Government cannot do this without working in collaboration with uh, industry. Uh, so you know, I, I, regulation uh, is helpful in some industries uh, to ensure that you have a baseline uh, level of security, uh, but you can't regulate innovation and folks in our sector, the communication sector, companies like AT&T, they're innovators in the security arena. We want to do everything to allow that innovation to go forward, to, to test what works, to see what doesn't work, how to make it better. Um, so I am optimistic uh, that we are, our heads are now in, uh, in the right uh, mindset to uh, make some real progress and we are hopeful. I think, I think Robert kind of hit the nail on the head earlier when he was talking about how cybersecurity has gone from something that was kind of talked about as impacting banks and like big companies and government agencies. And, and what we're seeing now with these recent ransomware attacks is they're affecting everyday people. You know, they're, they're causing the price of gasoline to spike. They're causing, you know, shortages potentially of, of different, you know, different, we saw the issues with the, um, with the meat industry or, you know, here recently. So I just feel like, um, the, the, there's, we, we, I think we've seen, we've kind of hit a tipping point, right, or a, uh, an inflection point where this whole issue has now gone from being this kind of high in the sky government discussion about, well, how do we deal with this? You know, government agencies getting hacked or big companies being hacked, and it's really affecting everyday people now. And so I think we're at a, we're at a point where um, we do need to rethink, um, you know, like I said, I think the policy we put in place hasn't been wrong, and it's actually made a lot of progress over the last decade. I don't want to lose sight of that, but I also feel like you know, as these issues start to affect more individuals, um, we do need to at least go back and look at what's been done, build on that, and try to make sure that we're building in better security going forward. And I think that's really the challenge of our day. I mean, more if you look at what's going on in networks, um, there are there are literally you know billions of devices connected to our networks. That, that those numbers are only going to uh, increase in a significant way, and you know over the next five to ten years. So this the problem is not going away anytime soon. And so I think we've just got to rethink you know, the importance of security. And, it, and it's really a broader issue than a technical problem, right? In a way, it's a societal problem of making security a priority that we put the money behind and we put the resources behind and we make it something that is really table stakes to the to the to 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 all these other things that are happening. It's not, it's not something that's layered on after the fact where we find out, hey, we rolled out a product and all of a sudden we got security problems. Now we got to layer on security. It really needs to be something that's built in from the get-go 
And, and that needs to become really a bigger priority than it has been. And I, and I think we're kind of there. I think what we've seen with all these incidents is that it's going to be that way going forward. And, you know, frankly, I don't think it's partisan. I, I don't, regardless of whatever administration's in office, I just, have, I just feel like this is an issue that's going to be a priority, you know, um, going forward, which is a good thing. Yeah. I definitely agree. Um, thank you both again for joining us today. We really appreciate your advice. And we will be uh, sharing this with our network and promoting on social media. Um, thank you for, uh, for your time.